Your lighting is way better than mine. Well, you know, what's funny is if you actually came over here and saw what constituted my lighting, uh, you'd be surprised at how good it ends up looking on screen. Uh, <laughs> that was actually something we were talking about, Corey and I, uh, I think on the last episode, was like, you know, how, how far camera technology has come mm. that, you know, there's like a lamp hanging over my desk that's just like a pretty dim, just standard lamp. It's not some kind of like videography lamp. And then I have a swing arm lamp, you know, like the Pixar style swing arm lamp pointed at the wall just to give me like some diffuse light and that's it. And it looks this good. Whereas like when I started my show, I had to have tons of lights blasting me in the face just to get a, a halfway decent picture. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, see, I mean, you're, you're in California too, right? So you probably get a little bit of sun every now and then. Well, I do, but I am in the basement right now. So there's no, yeah. there's no sun down here. No, I mean your your skin pigment though oh, in general. Yes. Well, <laughs> I am I am part Sicilian, that probably helps too. Oh, that doesn't hurt. Yeah. 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 I'm way too Irish and English to have any color. Right. So. Uh so, uh right off the top, I got I got a bunch of stuff I'm going to hit you with right off the top here. So, okay. uh this is my first time doing the show without Corey, you know, so it's uh like the training wheels are off. Mhm. Mm um so you had, you brought this up this morning in the Discord. So I, I kind of wanted to give you a chance to weigh in. Oh no! Uh, on th this was the uh, "Does it slap or should we eat it?" question from last episode, and uh, the the three things that I let Corey choose from were "Fantasy" by Mariah Carey, "This Is How We Do It" by Montel Jordan, and "Return of the Mac" by Mark Morrison. And I mean, I came up to me. It was almost like I was asking myself the question in the car one day. And I wasn't even really sure, like, does Corey even like those songs? I have no idea. But, like, for me, those are three songs where if I'm channel surfing on the car stereo and any of them are on, you, you stop. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm going to listen to that. Yeah. yeah. No, like, that's, they're on my, I use Spotify, and they're on my list. And, like, those are the, those are songs that if I'm in the car, especially with my kids, like, that's getting cranked max volume, and I'm just belting it out right along with it, like, you know, loud enough for them to loud enough for anybody with the windows down for anybody in the neighborhood to hear. So I can watch them just sink slowly into the bottom of their seats as hard as they can. No, when you asked it, I was like, because I was actually listening to it this morning while I was in the in a parking lot waiting for my son. And you first just said, um, this is how we do it and return to the Mac. And you kind of you held off on the fantasy part of it. So I was just like, well, man, that's a rough question. Like, but I probably have to go with this is how we do it. Um on and the the weirdest reason is I think because the hook in that is actually from another song that I used to love, which was Children's Story mm -hmm. by Slick Rick. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, well, it's gotta be that, because plus it's just a great song. But then you said fantasy, and I'm like, oh man. That's I don't know. And and Having thought about it more, I think I'd have to keep fantasy. It's just it, so it, hard, you know. It's so great. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I, that's so. an example. I like that song better than uh, you know "Genius of Love" by Tom Tom Club, which I don't. I don't know. It's 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 more. That song does more than just sample. Fantasy does more than just sample "Genius of Love," but uh, right. Yeah. Um. All right. Anyway, hey. So I thought, you know. I'm going to put you in the hot seat here a little bit. I came up with a few rapid fire questions. Okay. So I guess just try to answer them as quickly as possible without thinking too much, if you can. All right. Uh, number one, all time favorite breakfast cereal. Um, Lame. Frosted Flakes. That's not lame at all. Frosted Flakes are great. Uh, all time favorite Hall and Oats song. Uh,. Probably Kiss is on my list. All right. The answer we were looking there uh, for there actually was Out of Touch, but Kiss is on my list. It's also great a great song. Pick a franchise, F-Zero or Wipeout? F-Zero. Wow, that was quick. Yeah. I would have had to think about that, but I appreciate uh, your quickness. Lastly, Neo Geo Pocket Color or the Atari Lynx? Pocket Color. Yeah, I think yeah. so too. I was just playing mine uh, night before last. That was an interesting man. I remember getting that thing and and just loving it. Like the Lynx, I have one. I had one back in the day too, but I got it used, and it was just like 
I want to like this so badly. But it just never, ever, it never clicked with me. You know, I liked Clax. I played yeah. a lot of Clax yeah. on it. It's an acquired taste, I think. It's like eating yeah. eating intestines or something, you know, <laughs> eating tripe. Yeah. If you like tripe, you like either. tripe. But if you don't, then maybe you don't. So uh, I got to introduce the show here real quick. So you're listening to episode 29 of Here's My Question for You. Uh, as you may have gleaned from the conversation thus far, uh, Corey is not with us this week, but uh, he wanted me to make it very clear to everybody that he's not dead. He's fine. Uh, he knows his family listens to the show, and he just wants, he doesn't want them to hear this and be like, oh my God, where's dad? You know, where's my son? Where's my husband? He's fine. He just can't be on the show this week. So, in his place, who do we have? I'm going to give you, this is my first time ever introducing someone like this in my 10 years of content creation. So, uh, ready? I'm, Back I'm in the ready. late 90s, he got his start. As the creator and editor-in-chief of Gaming Age Online, he was a writer and editor for Ziff Davis Publications, including Electronic Gaming Monthly and Pocket Gamer. He's a 20-year veteran of the games development industry. For 11 years, he's been producing the Generation 16 YouTube show, but you probably know him best as the co-creator and almost 17-year co-host of the Player One podcast. He's Nova Scotia's finest, Greg Seward. You, I couldn't have done that. You well, know more about me than I do. I looked it up a little bit. Has it really been 17 years? Almost 17 years? Uh, 16 years, 8 months is what Jesus. it says. I logged into LinkedIn using my phony LinkedIn profile. <laughs> well, I you like... were the new person that looked at my LinkedIn profile. Oh, today? Profile. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, uh, I don't I'm not a fan of I don't need I understand the need for some people to have LinkedIn. I don't need LinkedIn. And right. so I don't really want to put my personal information there. So I made a fake account and uh, the profile picture is Judge Smales from uh, Caddyshack. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's me. That was me. You just that was my whole life. Yeah. I mean, well, in video games, yeah. I hope to talk about that a bit more later, yeah. but First, I, I can't pivot that quickly from just talking about the normal uh, drudgery of my life that I talk about with uh, Corey, you know, complaining about various things. So uh, I have to complain a little bit. And so you have to listen to it this time. So, okay. uh, so I don't know how regularly you listen to the show. So I don't know if you're up to speed on this yet or not. But uh, and pardon my uh, cultural ignorance. But uh, do you guys have Target up there? We had Target. Target in Canada is a whole story. We had oh, Target for wow. about, I think, 12 to 18 months. And oh, it was that's so horribly very short. mismanaged yeah. that it disappeared. Well, maybe they sent the managers down here. Because uh, you know, I, this was several episodes ago. I went on some whole rant about how much I hate Target now. And I just want... This is almost uh, just a, a postscript to that. It's, it's pretty quick. But... Uh, you know, I'd mentioned, I, I don't want to shop at Target anymore. I just, I go in there. They don't have the things I want. I don't understand what's going on. There's just like empty shelves, uh, and whatnot. But, uh, this was kind of like the nail in the coffin for me, I guess is, uh, I, this was the first, it was just yesterday. It was the first time I'd gone into Target it since whenever it was that I talked about it on the show, I needed some things that they sell there. So, uh, but the last time I was in there, they had like put up this temporary wall over like at the front of the store there was a starbucks which is strange to me because no. there's a starbucks in the parking lot like a real starbucks and then there's the inside i guess that's for if you're in like a huge hurry but uh and then next to the starbucks was uh like a snack bar that they had like little pizza hut personal size pizzas and uh uh importantly they had popcorn but uh, I don't I don't know what kind of store uh, maybe you grew up with that might be analogous to this. But like when I was a kid, we had like Kmart, which was just like, you know, a, a department store or whatever. And uh, later Target did this, too, but where they would have like a luncheonette in the store. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you would go yeah, sit they, down. Right. And you'd order like I'll take a, you know, a grilled cheese sandwich and some fries, you know, or whatever, you know, and you could yeah. sit down and eat it. And, uh, you know, I used to always enjoy that about Target. And then they got rid of it. And then it was just like a walk up, 
snack bar situation, nowhere to sit, you know, which I don't know. Where are you supposed to eat your Pizza Hut pizza, which I wasn't getting anyway, right. but, you know, whatever. But importantly, they had the popcorn. Because if you think about it, and may, again, I don't know how it is up there, but around here, there's just not that many places to get popcorn anymore that don't involve it being a place where you had to pay admission just to get in, right? Like, obviously, you can sure. go to a ball game or you can go to, like, the zoo or something and you can get popcorn. But there's not anywhere I can just go walk up and say, you know, bag of popcorn, please, and then and then go on my merry way, right? But mm-hmm. but Target still had it, and it was pretty decent popcorn, right? So when I go in there and the whole thing, Starbucks and the snack bar, is is walled off, I'm just like, whoa, I got to find a red shirt stat. Right. They all wear red shirts, the employees. So I found one. I was just like, hey, you know, what's uh, what's going on over there? You know, and they go, like, oh, we're making some changes or whatever to the, the food situation over there. And I just I specifically asked, I said, you're still going to have popcorn, though. Right. And she goes, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. Like, we're not getting rid of the popcorn. We're not crazy. Like, yeah. I was like, OK, well, thank goodness. Right. And then I bought whatever I was buying, you know, toilet paper and cat food. Uh, and I got out of there. Right. And this was whenever this was a long time ago. So I go in there last night and I had already ordered you can you know you can do the thing where you order your stuff online and just walk in and pick it up cuz you know for reasons that have already been discussed walking around Target now is depressing. So it's like I want to walk in, here's my ID, give me my stuff, I'm out of here, you know. But I, I walk in there and you know walking through the parking lot, I was like the first thing I was worried about is like I got to go I want to look and see what's going on with this whole snack bar situation cuz it's at the front of the store anyway, right? So I walk in, I turn to the right and I look and the temporary wall is gone. The Starbucks is still there looking exactly like it ever looked. So it's not like the Starbucks got expanded or anything. Not that I care because I don't need it to be. It's the exact same. But then where the the snack bar was is now just a solid wall. And like they painted on the wall, like, thanks for shopping at Target. Because that's the last thing you see when you go through the checkout lines. So... They just like deleted the entire snack bar and Clinton. I looked cause it was closed the, the, the Starbucks, but I, I looked in there. I'm like, okay, is the popcorn machine in the Starbucks now? No. And so then I went over to pick up my order and I just, you know, I said, oh, I'm here to pick up an order, but just, you know, I had a real quick question first. And I just told, I asked her, I'm like, you know, what's going on over there? Is there not popcorn <laughs> anymore? And she's like, no, there's no more popcorn. So I was it lied to, but it's just like, it's like one more little thing. You know, and it's, this isn't even just about me and Target anymore. It's about, you know, that sounds like a that sounds like a letter to the CEO. Really? I don't know. I mean, well, what's ironic is that the that place when I was a kid where you went and had like the luncheonette was a place called Zeller's. Oh, yes. I've heard of I've never right. seen a Zeller's in person, but I'm aware of their existence. And that's not strange. But um, Zeller's is the store that Target bought. Oh. The locations, uh, the target locations up here were previously Zellers. I see, and then they went out of business, and so Target destroyed our luncheonettes too. Yeah. So where I grew up, our Zellers was a place called Gemco, mm-hmm. and that's what Target bought out to move in to our territory. Although I don't, I have no memory of Gemco having a luncheonette, but that doesn't mean they didn't. But it's just right. like, you know. Target was already on extremely thin ice with me, and then it's like now you're going to get rid of the popcorn. Because again, where am I now? I'm just I'm just making popcorn at home, I guess. But that's just you know I can make uh, like anything a, at home. I can make yeah. a hamburger at home. I want to go out and get a hamburger. You know, the so you're saying that I had to sit through your complaining. Yeah, like just so you know, like that's the reason I like the show. Okay, that's cool. Um, because you and Corey are both like mid forties. Yeah, gamer guys who are you know. We're not, and I, I, I totally loop myself in with you guys. Like, we're not like completely crotchety and, and angry about absolutely everything at this point. Yeah, but like, you're you're totally on the cusp of like totally getting your dad or your grandfather. Oh, yeah. why they were so angry about things. One hundred, and it's little crap like that, right? Because it's a hundred little things like that. It's like what Costco right. hot dogs. You ends. know, where's the where's the sauerkraut? Why right. did you get rid of the sauerkraut? Do you guys have Costco up there? Yeah, yeah, for so you, sure. Do you have? Yeah. Is there hot dogs up there? I don't know. Maybe, yeah, like maybe up there it's like buck fifty poutine instead of hot dogs. I don't know. <laughs> they don't think they have poutine there. They okay. should. So no, you know, I've been going to Costco since I was like a teenager. So you know, long time. And the the hot dogs have always been a buck fifty. And the way mm-hmm. they keep them a buck fifty is they just keep getting like 
crappier and crappier and crappier, you know? And it's like, I don't mind, like, double the price. Triple, like, 450 yeah. for a yeah. hot dog that huge with the toppings they used to offer and a soda. It's a good deal. In today's economy is a screaming deal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyway. Anything else I'm going to complain about, I think I can just wait until uh, next time. Yeah. Although, hey, uh, I forget. Did you get it on the whole cassette tape craze during the pandemic? I started to do that a little bit when you were doing videos of it. I thought that was pretty yeah. great. Yeah. Um, I did. I tried that once. All right. But um, it didn't stick. So that's fine. That's probably for the best. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. We're gonna. Wait I mean, for I was that. in the whole cassette tape craze. You know, in the early '90s. Sure. Who wasn't? <laughs> Um, all right, so I have a short list of things here to talk to you about. So uh, okay. this is what I wanted to start with, though. Uh, my favorite thing to talk about on my show is the Sega Genesis. Like, you started a whole channel dedicated to the Sega Genesis, which tells me that we're kindred Sega Genesis spirits. Absolutely. So yeah. I just kind of wanted to hear about how you like how you got a Genesis, when you got a Genesis... But although first, uh, well, two pieces of important information. Uh, if you don't mind, how old are you? 40. I turned 40. Jesus, hang on. I screwed this up. Somebody asked me this last week and I totally aged myself because that's how old I am now. Uh, 47 next okay, week. Okay, perfect. In a few days. That's yeah. an excellent age to be for this con. Yeah. In the context of this conversation. Okay. Um, what video game systems uh, or if it was home computer instead or whatever what like what were your uh what video game appliances did you use prior to getting a genesis um we had and i don't know where we got it I, I i have a theory and unfortunately my dad passed a few years ago so i never got a chance to ask him this but we always had an atari 2600 i don't remember a time when we didn't have an atari 2600 uh which would have been what 1977 which was the year after i was born um i think it's because my dad kind of took care of his youngest brother who was around 18 when I was born. So he was the perfect age for like the, the Atari VCS craze. Yeah. Cause like their, their dad had passed away uh, in 76. So my father was like a father figure to his little brother. And my mom said that he, she believes he bought the 2600 for my uncle. Yeah. But then of course he grew out of it. So we just had it. So like that was that was the first console I remember having, and my brother and I played the hell out of that, like dodge him and combat and stuff like that were our two sort of go to games. Um, but then we got a Nintendo, we got an NES, and that was kind of an NES and a Game Boy was kind of my my console uh, history leading up to the Genesis. Yeah, yeah, same yeah. here. So yeah. um, I'm going to interject this right now, then, because like you're you could not have answered that question more perfectly for what I wanted to bring okay. up. So um, I think the episode just came out a few weeks ago, but it was a couple months ago that I was on there. Uh, I was a guest on a Gamer Looks at 40. He was a friend of yours. Uh, mm, Bill, yeah, right? Bill, great Bill. guy. Yeah. yeah. And he said something just not as a throwaway, but it was just like something he just sort of said, and then we moved on without it becoming like a topic for discussion that I kind of can't stop thinking about, which, uh, you know, he mentioned that like, because he was thinking about his kids, and he's like, "Well, are our kids going to be? Well, I don't have kids, but you know, you have kids. He has kids. Are are today's kids going to be as nostalgic for video games when they're our age as we are now for the games that we had when we were a kid?" And but what he said, he said that he thought that you know our generation was a little bit unique in that we grew up with video games, but video games also grew up with us. Yeah, and I remember him saying that. And I just feel like if, you know, the reason I couldn't stop thinking about it is I just really thought about how, like, at every step of the way, I felt like I was the target audience for, like, yes. the games du jour, right? Like, when the NES was out and I was in, like, late elementary school, the games were, like, targeted towards me. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that I love the Genesis so much is I felt that out of the two, you know, major 16-bit systems that was the system that I felt more was marketed towards my age group as a, as a teenager. Oh my God. Not, yes. yes. Not to slander. I mean, the super Nintendo is, is greatness is, uh, 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 not up for debate, obviously, mm -hmm. but yeah. you know, the Genesis was the like, Hey, you, there was even an ad. 
that I I know I showed it on my show at some point. I don't. It was you know, an ad in the magazines that was kind of like about you're you're growing out of the NES and like now you're you're gonna play with the. It was something about play with the big boys, I think, and it was show, it showed a mm-hmm. Genesis, and then you know even with the PlayStation, you know it was I felt like you know I was in my early twenties. I think I was well, I was eighteen when it came out, but I didn't get one. But I, I still felt like those games were marketed towards me. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right, and. We, I mean, the other thing that was happening then too is that it was so much more laser focused. Like the industry, the games weren't so ubiquitous as they are now. You know, like everybody plays video games now. Like your mom plays video games now, you know, and it's like, not that that's a bad thing, but it's like if you have a computer, you have a phone or whatever, like you can play video games. But back then, if you wanted to play video games, you either had a computer or you had one of the two or three systems that were on the market, usually only one of which was even that popular. Right. So, yeah. And and I'm I'm I mean, like you said, we're pretty much the same age and I felt exactly the same way because I was so hardcore into the Nintendo in the late 80s. I was ready and I'm waiting for the Super Nintendo. But I there was the longest time where it was out, but we didn't know when it was coming here. And uh, in the meantime, you've got Sega over here. It's like, you know, doesn't what Nintendo don't and like, you know, you want to be cool and that that cool kid thing. I, I think if you weren't there and you weren't the right age for it, you just don't realize how brilliant and how effective their marketing was because like we're we're the MTV generation. Right. Although yeah. we didn't have MTV up here. But I mean, when you go back and you look at when Sega was really killing it in the early 90s with their marketing and you look at what MTV was doing, like if you look at commercials and everything that were running on MTV they're edited the exact same way like one belongs with the other so i mean yeah that was that was what lured me over was just like well i gotta try this thing i love nintendo and i can't wait for my super nintendo and i'm gonna buy one but i really you know man this place rents the genesis and i gotta try this out and just fell in love with it so that was your your first experience with the genesis was renting one yeah 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 because i mean you know again same thing with rentals like Everywhere around here, you could rent Nintendo. You could rent Nintendo games. It was like we had a corner store literally down the block that they had. Every place had like at least five or ten cartridges you could rent, right? So that was no problem. But then we found this place in the next town over where my my dad and uncle um, stored their race car because I used to go help them work on the race car on the weekends. And there was this place that had Genesis and it was on demo and everything like that. They had everything. They had Neo Geo as well and like... It was just it was a video game place. And it was like, man, if if I can get my dad to put 200 bucks deposit down on his visa, I can take this thing home for the weekend. And, and I've got to try it because, again, been seeing those ads like crazy. And yeah, and, and yeah, you, rented it. Do you remember about when that was? It would have been uh, it was late 1990, early 1991, somewhere in there. Sonic was if it wasn't on the way, it was like a month later that I learned about it. So that yeah. was right around the time. Do you remember what, uh, when you rented the system then, like what games did you get with yep. it? Yep, Super Monaco GP and Forgotten Worlds. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Those are good ones. Monaco GP in particular was just like, I've never played anything like this on a console. Yeah, right. I love that game. Like it, yeah. it looks amazing. Like I can see the guy's hands. Yeah. I can see the wheels turning. Like this is un- this is unreal. So that was what sold me on the system. That was when I decided I wanted to buy one. Did you fig- did you remember if you figured out when you had that rental console if you could hit the flagman? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I'd read it in a magazine at some oh, point. Oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, and then, like, how much longer was it before you actually got a Genesis? I got. Well, when did Sonic come out? June. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I literally bought it two weeks before Sonic became a pack in. Oh no! Like the, so, you didn't even have the thing where you could send in the. No. No. Because they did no. that for a while, right? Like you, they, they did, you, and then you got two games free. Yeah, yeah. No, I ended up getting the system that didn't have a pack in. Oh, um, and then I went to. Uh, you guys were talking about one of these places before Bree Software. I think you were talking about Bre Software. Previously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a Bre. I just said Bree, but there was another Sorry. company that always advertised in the back pages of all those magazines called Chips and Bits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they had Altered Beast for three bucks. Oh wow. So I just, you know, I didn't have any money left because I just spent it all on a Genesis. Sure. 
And so it's like, well, I need something. I'm going to order Altered Beast for three bucks. Yeah, of course. And uh, yeah, so I got that. And that was, you know, that was 20 minutes of my life when it showed up. But yeah, it was still nice to have. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, I mean, you remember like just some of the games you got that maybe are, are you know, less. I mean, obviously, everybody like games like Sonic, but uh, right. You know, what kind of like sort of movie sleeper games that you ended up picking up one way um, or another. I ended up getting. Do you ever play the Immortal? You ever played that no. EA game? No, I know. So I know what you're talking came, about, but I don't. I haven't played it. It actually came out on the NES, and I owned it on the NES, and it was good. Um, but EA released it on the Genesis, and it's supremely gory. Yeah, right. Like you, you're playing as this wizard. You've seen that. Like you, when you fight, like you end up splitting them down the middle, and like there's just just blood and gore everywhere. And of course, you know, for a 15 year old kid. I mean, that's an adult game then. That's, you know, this is exactly what Sega's telling me about when they're saying that this is for me. Right. So that was an early one for me. But for the one early on that really, really stands out, and it's because of my friends being so excited about it, was NHL Hockey. Oh, the original NHL Hockey. Yeah. Yeah. The first EA one. Because I ended up getting that. And I remember that, like, I was the only one of my friends that had a Genesis. I had a group of friends. We all had Nintendos. We were all waiting for Super Nintendo, and then I pulled the trigger on a Genesis. So, like, you had, I had friends that would come down and, you know, want to check out the games, and everything's cool. And I was like, this is really neat. But they never – nobody wanted to buy one. And then I got NHL hockey, and people started coming down and playing it. And that was when I had friends who started buying a Genesis. Yeah. It was that game. You know, like that – I don't – I'm guessing that Madden might have had the same effect in the U.S., because I know football's so much more popular. Yeah. But – here hockey obviously so it was just like so that was the one that's the early one i remember people and i remember me being super excited about it and just spending tons and tons of time on the other one that i loved even though it was technically pretty awful was hard driving i played a ton of hard driving on my genesis yeah i mean i love the arcade game but i'm definitely in the camp yeah. that doesn't enjoy the genesis version but i mean maybe if i had had it i'd feel the same way as you you know yeah no, I mean, you know, that's how we were back then too. Is like, and the NES had done this for us, where if you played those, if you played a game in the arcade and you got the home version of it, a lot of the work was done by your imagination. Oh, for sure, right? Yeah, you know, it's like, well, I recognize this is the same track as the one I play in the arcade. That's good enough. I yeah, it's only running at like fifteen frames a second, but uh, yeah, it was good enough for me. <laughs> yeah. Did you were you the kind of person like did you uh since you were a fan of the NHL hockey game like would you go out every year and get the new iteration? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I until uh I mean I think I was buying them right up until the 96. So up till 95 I was buying. Yeah. Every how did you iteration. feel about I mean everybody, you know, talks about how great 94 is and I, I mean I don't disagree. It's a good game, but do you remember how you felt about 95 when it came out cuz that was sort of like a whole new game engine, right? I really liked it. I mean, when I bought 95, that's what I played, you know, looking back on it, I think I probably do prefer 94, Yeah, but I love 95. Like, I think that's the, I still have that in my collection. I think it's actually my original, like with the white case and everything like that. Like, yeah, but I was also crazy about, uh, 94 on CD. I was a big Sega CD fan. Oh, so, yeah. So that was the one my friends and I played all the time. So, you know, yeah. which was just the cartridge version with the. The recording real, of the uh the, organ. the crowd and the know. organ that was a real organ and recording. the organ yeah. yes with Dieter yeah. Rula is that who was playing it yeah yeah he's the I, organist for the LA Kings and uh, uh also the stupid Dodgers but um that was like one of the things that made 94 sort of better you know the original didn't even have organ music and no. then uh NHLPA had organ music but I think it was just sort of generic and uh, for some reason, they 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 hooked up with this Dieter, Dieter Rula guy. Uh, I'm gonna guess he's German. And um, <laughs> I don't know why. I think it was just a thing of his. Like he liked knowing. Like he knew all the organ music that was played in like all of the NHL arenas. Even though, like, obviously he didn't travel with the team because he only played the organ at home. But right. you know. He was able to to you know work with uh, the guys at EA to kind of 
tell them, you know, or, or help them program it. Like, no, no, you got to put brass bonanza in there for the for the Hartford Whalers and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that was one of the reasons why EA was so good at that stuff, though, right? It was those kind of details. Because, I mean, I remember when FIFA came out, they were there was a big deal about how all the proper chants were, yeah. were for the different, I don't know what you call them, stadiums, I guess. For, yeah. For, uh, I think so. For soccer. But, you know, like, it's funny. This is like one of those curmudgeonly old man things because I take my kids to, we don't have an NHL team here because we're way too small, but we have what's called the QMJHL here. Uh, we have the Halifax Mooseheads. Oh. Um, Quebec Major Junior League before you try to figure that out. Yeah. But anyway, it's in the same building that I used to go watch AHL games with my dad. Like, mm-hmm. we had an AHL team when I was growing up. And um, there was an organ. They had an organ. Like, when in between plays, they didn't play top 40 or, or like, stadium rock. They yeah. played – he played the organ. And that the, – the, the it's gone now. And I remember saying that to one of my kids recently. It was just like, I mean, this music's great. Sure, why not? Stadium rock's awesome when you're at the game. It's a good time. But I miss the organ. Yeah. Like it just – it so much personality, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, were there any other, besides NHL games? Were there any other sports games? Um, that was my NHL was my big thing, and uh, ra- any racing game. Yeah, did you get I uh, shop those? But it... Super Monaco GP two when it came out, I Ayrton Senna. Oh yeah, I I loved Ayrton Senna. Yeah. He was like my 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 favorite driver. Yeah. So, yeah, and like beyond beyond the limit, Formula One beyond the limit. I actually liked. Yeah. That game is unplayable. But yeah, it's not not a fan. Y- yeah, but I played through it. Like championship, everything. Like I was really into it, so yeah. Yeah, but I was all in all those things. So since you were into the Sega CD, do you have a Model One Sega CD? Oh hell yeah! Oh good, it's good, good. In the case, it's dark right now, but it's in the case back there. Oh, I see it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah the Tower of Power. Yeah. What uh, any particular games besides the the two you just mentioned, uh, NHL ninety four and Formula <clears> One? I mean, a lot of the standards. You know, uh, Snatcher loved Snatcher. The Lunar Games. Anything working designs I would play for sure. sure. Yeah. Um, but I, I would play anything. I road road Avenger. I loved, and I, I really liked full, full motion video games. I know that we weren't really supposed to, but well, wow. like Sewer Shark, I could play over and over again. <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like, like you know, full motion video video games are really easy target for people yeah. now. But you know, I. I remember seeing anything that was not even, even if it was just pre-rendered graphics back then in the game, you'd just be like, wow, you know, mm-hmm. like, uh, like the intro to like, like out magic. of this world, you know, or another world, depending on what you had. Like that was, we yeah. used to just watch that intro over and over again. And that was just a pre-rendered, what it wasn't even full motion video. It was just a, you know, pre-rendered whatever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, anytime we saw any kind of full motion video, we just thought that was, you know, awesome. But I mean that that was like I said it was like magic. I remember turning turning that thing on the first time and playing Sherlock Holmes. And I mean Sherlock Holmes is it's a nothing game, but it's playing full motion video. That like, came with the Genesis. console, right? It did, yeah. 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 The software suite for that console was really awesome. Yeah. You got a lot of games with that thing. Yeah, cuz you got uh Soul Feast, Soul Feast, the, the arcade uh collection. Yep. Uh the the Sherlock Holmes game. There was that wasn't that was that video rock or whatever CD that had like that was later. Oh, that was later. Uh, All right, so, virtual VCR it was called, rock. Yeah, I have it, but uh, I had to buy it recently actually. But and then it came with the two music samplers, the CD plus G disc. Oh yeah, and the, yeah. that's what I was thinking was, of. Yeah, that was the first time I heard they might be giants was on that sampler disc. Oh, what song was I never it? Heard you remember? Of Anim- mammal. Oh, it's mammal. I like Birdhouse in Your Soul. Oh, there are plenty better They Might Be Giants songs than yeah. Mammal. But that was just the first time I ever heard them. Yeah. Uh, all right. Hey, I think now is a good time. Uh, I'll be, first of all, cards on the table. I, I mentioned this earlier. You know, Corey is the technical, you know, heart of the show. I don't I don't know how to do any of that stuff. So uh, it's time for Does It Slap or Should We Eat It? But, uh, right. you know, what I was trying to say is that I, there's not going to be a theme song today because I don't. He's the one that plays it. I don't even know how to set that up to, you know, pipe music into the show. I can't you do, do that. You don't just have like 
a full speaker system behind you with six feet from the edge just cued? Oh, God. Or- no, but I'm still thinking I'm not going to, you know, I'm sure Corey's going to end up listening to this show, so I'm not going to uh, divulge any secrets, but uh, I'm still thinking of new ways to uh, <laughs> make him listen to that clip of that song. So, God. yeah. It's- when you guys, sorry, I'm going to go back to this. When you guys were talking about them, oh, my God, the band's name just totally went out of my head. Creed. Creed. Yeah. I couldn't remember any other song other than Higher. Yeah. But then when he played Six Feet from the Edge a couple weeks ago, I was like, oh my God, that's the other Creed song I know. Like, I know two Creed songs, and that's the other one. Did it happen to get stuck in your head? Do you remember? Yeah. Because it got stuck in my head for like a day and a half. That's why he keeps doing it to me, is it it, it just gets stuck in there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So... (laughs) I mean, I thought about pulling my phone out and just like playing the "Does It Slap" or "Should We Eat It" theme song, but that's just lame. So I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you know this. One of the two theme songs was uh, written and performed by a neighbor of yours. I know to, uh, Prince Edward Island. North. Yeah, Prince Edward Island. Are you guys on an island? Is that t- is Nova Scotia an island, or is there like do they slip a little land bridge on in on There's you there? A somewhere? Tiny little land bridge there. We are okay. a peninsula. All right. Yeah. Uh, do you guys have? Because, I mean, you're so close together and you're both, you know, uh, you're not technically an island. I get that. But uh, do the mussels come hang around Nova Scotia, too, or do they stay up there by do you guys have to import the mussels? Um, No, I think we 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 must have mussels. Yeah. And then we have clams and lobster and fish and fishery is a big deal here. Isn't it right? like but I yeah. feel like when, you know, I, I see like, oh, it's like PEI mussels. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you guys make a lot of locks there. Is that my, my memory faulty? I feel like I see like I, Nova Scotia locks. I didn't even know that was a thing until I moved to Chicago. Oh, all right. So you think maybe I've never that's heard just, of it. So that might be just yeah. marketing BS. Yeah, it might be. I mean, it might. the fish might come from here. I don't know. Maybe. But it's not something that you, you don't go into a store and order that here. Yeah. I mean, I feel you like, know. you know, you guys are really sliding under the radar there so much that I feel like anybody anywhere else in North America could have any product and if they wanted to add some cachet to it be like oh yeah no this is from uh this is flown in from nova scotia you'd be like wow where is that i don't even know it's it's so funny to be to grow up from here because kind of like what you just said like nobody knows where nova scotia is nobody knew where nova scotia was so like every now and then you'd hear it referenced i remember it being referenced in die hard with the vengeance oh of all things right at the end when they're making their escape and they're in montreal they talk about how they're about to go to Nova Scotia. And I was in a theater when that happened. And there are people like, oh, he said Nova Scotia. He, yeah. He said Nova Scotia. Like, whenever that happens, because we were just so small and in, no, in the middle of nowhere, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not like California where you well, know, everything takes place. So. Yes and no. But yes, I'm, I'm born and raised in California. But the city that I'm from is not right. something that norm- – so exactly what you just said. Like the city I grew up in got mentioned in the Karate Kid, and so I remember we oh, saw, we saw that and we're like, oh my god, it's awesome! We got mentioned in Karate Kid. Somebody knows we exist. Yeah, exactly. So um, important. All right, so this this is a does it slap or should we eat it that uh, you know is custom tailored for you. So oh no, um, probably not going to be as cool as the one we already talked about, but I hope it will also help uh, act as uh, sort of a bridge into the next discussion. So okay. Here are your three things for does it slap or should we eat it? Item one, Nintendo Power. Item okay. two, video games and computer entertainment. Oh. Item three, diehard game fan. Oh. And correct me if I'm wrong, I tried to make sure, I mean, obviously not Nintendo Power. I tried to make sure that there was no Ziff Davis anything no, you're right. So that I, you know, you can remain yeah. completely uh, uh, ob- professionally objective. Ah, uh, that's tough. And you know what? Based on different parts of my life, I would make different choices. Right. That's why it's because, like Nintendo Power, the first issue of Nintendo Power that came here was the Mega Man Two cover, uh, and I was crazy about that. Um diehard game fan during all the genesis sega cd era that was the magazine to read they were the only ones who covered everything but you know what i think i would probably keep 
Out of the three of them, video games and computer entertainment. Can I just say that I am surprised you said that, but I'm happy that you said that. <laughs> I loved that magazine. Yeah. That was when you in the days of reading EGM and Nintendo Power, that magazine felt older. Yeah. Andy Eddy, the editor, was amazing. Plus, he also had a major chip on his shoulder for Nintendo, which when I started getting into the Genesis, I kind of liked <laughs> as well. Um, I remember him writing an editorial once about Dr. Mario and how Nintendo was uh, sort of giving kids uh, the green light to play with drugs. It, it made no sense. Yeah, it was a ridiculous statement. One. Yeah, But I, I remember reading that and being like, Hell yeah, you 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 stick it to him, Andy. Yeah. So, what's your stance on Doctor Mario? I wasn't crazy about it. Okay, it was okay. Yeah, that's. I mean, I always feel like I like you know, am I the a hole? Because I don't like. I just don't. And if you look, I mean, how many first party Nintendo games can you still buy for like nothing? Mm. You know, but. I just, you know, I had, well, Corey bought it. I didn't buy it, but uh, I had Corey pick me up a copy of Dr. Mario just because I, you know, I don't know if you saw, I did that video a little while ago about that Nintendo folder that, uh, yeah. that I got and it, I didn't show it on camera, but it also came with the box and instructions and the little piece of styrofoam for, Ooh. for Dr. Mario, but I don't have a copy. I'm like, well, I might as well get one and, you know, make it complete. And the I was just, instructions are probably worth more than the game. Yeah, well, that's what I saw. The game—it's like a five-dollar game. I think that's what. It's uh, uh, crazy. Corey picked it up for me at Midwest Gaming Classic for like five bucks. Yeah, no, I was never a fan. Tetris, Tetris was like the be-all end-all. That was the worst part about the puzzle game craze was that it started with the best one. Right. That's what I. That's how I felt. Back everything else that would come out, I'd be like, I'd rather play like Columns. Tetris. Columns is cool, I guess, but I'd way yeah. rather play Tetris. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. So part of the reason that I did that for the does it slap or should we eat it is um, and I'm sorry, you've probably been asked this many times before or whatever, but I find it fascinating anyway, is if you could just kind of talk about your your professional journey and, sure. uh, you know, how you, you know, how you ended up getting into games journalism and games development, you know, your your time working, you know, for Ziff Davis, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Um, so, like, probably the, <laughs> the easiest way. Actually, it started in PEI. Because um, I, uh, <laughs> as a college dropout, this is one of my prouder moments. But, um, no, I, I just, when I was reading those magazines growing up, especially Game Fan, um, just because they were so excited all the time, I was a decent writer. You know, that was kind of my thing. I was in, in, more into English lit and stuff like that than than math or science and um, loved video games. But no, I had moved to uh, PEI to manage a game rental store. Uh, and that was around the time that I I had my own computer. I didn't have anything else to do. I didn't know any, I knew a few people, but not enough people to be going out every night. So I went home and I spent a lot of time on Usenet um, and really got into like the Rec Sega video, or Rec Video Sega and Rec Video Nintendo and all that stuff. And sort of just, found some like-minded people and at one point there was some guy whose name I do or not remember who ran a little Sega Saturn site just put a put the word out for writers and it's like I can do this I know I can do this so I sort of threw my name it wasn't for money I just threw my name in and uh right and he, he accepted it and me and one other guy Jim Cordera who actually still owns Gaming Age today um we sort of started together and we really hit it off anyway uh, Sam Kennedy, who I'm, I forget what he runs at this point, he had another website called Gaming Enthusiast Online who actually bought this little thing called Daily Saturn Gamer. So we ended up working with him. And then he got screwed over by his publisher. And we, a bunch of us got together and said, we can make our own site. We'll, we'll do this thing. It's Gaming Age. We're going to create Gaming Age. And um, we just sort of fell in. We used to, I don't know if you ever used to chat on, use IRC to chat with people. Yeah. MIRC. Yeah. So that's what we all used to, to communicate, right? Because it was real time. And we fell into this channel called Vid Games. Oh, yeah. Um, that was filled with people who, like, if you go back and look at the list of people who were in that channel, 
you know, like uh, John Riccardi was in there from 8-4. And a lot of the people who are at Ziff Davis, Mark McDonald, who, you know, uh, is making video games now. And there's uh, just so many of those people went on to be video game creators or or designers or but back then we were just a bunch of kids hanging out. But there were a bunch of Ziff Davis people in there. So that got us all noticed uh, on Gaming Age. And we just sort of kept doing our thing on Gaming Age. And one by one, we all got plucked from that website to uh, to to work at these different magazines. Um, I think I was... I think I got... Ga- Sam Kennedy went to Game Fan. And I remember when he said goodbye to us, like the last thing he said was like, you're going to be next. You're, there's somebody who's going to pick you up next. And yeah, that's that's what it was. Uh, John Riccardi had just been put in charge of Expert Gamer, uh, which isn't what I wanted. Um, it was because Expert Gamer was like a tips and tricks. It was the walkthroughs and stuff like that. I wanted to do two game reviews completely, um, but this was an opportunity. So, um, you know, he actually, I should say, Mark McDonald reached out before that. He was working at Official PlayStation Magazine, and he was running a magazine called Pocket Games that they did like quarterly <clears throat> in like 98, I think. And he said, like, would you like to do a bunch of reviews? It's like, sure. So he packed up probably two dozen Game Boy Color cartridges and sent them to me. And I uh, said, I, you know, you got to review these over the next couple weeks. And that was like the first time I was published. But that was a dry run. That was what I found out later was that was more like somebody like John saying, OK, I think he can come do this. So he reached out and offered me offered me a job at Ziff Davis in Chicago to write uh, to write game strategy guides every yeah. month, which was hellish work, by the way. I can imagine, yeah. So did you, yeah. did you move, that was, was it still in uh, Lombard? It was in Oak Brook at that point. Oh, all right. Yeah, they had moved they had from moved. Lombard to Oak Brook, which is only like a few miles away. Okay. <clears throat> uh, it's all the western suburbs of Chicago. Right. Um, so I always just say in Chicago, but we were... It was the Chicago land area, right, is what locals right. would call that. But, but so but did yeah. you actually move there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, I, nice. I worked. I technically worked there for a little while, uh, not legally because I didn't have my oh. my uh, work visa. Yeah. Yet, but yeah, like it was. Um, Mar- uh, uh, John had sent me a copy of Grandia. That was supposed to be my first. Um, walkthrough which i was really excited about because i had actually imported the saturn version of grandia um, and played through it i didn't understand it because i couldn't speak japanese but i right. muddled my way through it so i was like yeah absolutely i'll do that and you know i didn't need a i didn't need a dev unit or a, whatever they were called the blue playstations to play it on but then about a month into that he was like we've got to cover final fantasy origins which i think that was the one that had five and six on it on the playstation one yeah. Um, so can you fly down here uh, for like a week and just jam out a strategy for Final Fantasy VI? Yeah. So that was really my first experience. I got to go to the office, go into the office there for that. But yeah, after in October of 99, I moved down to, to uh, Lombard, actually, but was working in Oprah. Yeah. And then how, how long were they um, still in the Chicago area? I don't, I don't remember when they moved I think it was to... 2003 we moved to... Okay. San Francisco. So you were in Chicago for like a good four <clears throat> years or so. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was great. Although, you know, it's probably one of those things that a lot of people, um, as you get into like your 30s and 40s, if you've moved around a lot, which I was doing, I didn't take nearly enough advantage of the places that I'd been. Yeah. Like I I, I was outside Wrigley Field. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I just, I'm in a city where growing up in Halifax where like I said we had an AHL team but that was it and I'm kind of focusing on sports but just events in general there was really nothing here right um and I mean you're in Chicago some of the best restaurants in the world and like you know they have professional football and baseball and hockey and and basketball the bulls like and I just didn't I didn't take advantage of the city at yeah. all yeah um but that being said it was one of the greatest experiences of my life like we were all early 20 something uh mostly guys there were some women working although a lot of them were like uh on the art team and like the copy editing team and stuff like that and they were mostly just putting up with us it was like a frat house um for the for the most part but like i wouldn't trade it for the world we spent tons of hours at the office like i i slept at the office sometimes uh to get stuff out on deadlines because with of course with these magazines you had like a three-week cycle to get everything done um 
But I mean, we were all like minded. We were all there because we were so passionate about what we were doing. Um, we totally believed in it. We were part of, you know, EGM was like between that and Game Pro, they were the two biggest magazines yeah. in the United States as far as video games went. So I mean, you knew you were sort of on a winning team, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was fantastic, fantastic times. Have you ever listened to the uh there's that podcast, uh, A Life Well Wasted? Yeah. And uh they did the episode about uh the death of EGM. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I never listened to that episode, but I used to listen to that podcast. All right. Uh, um, yeah. So I, there's just a few things in that. So they they talked about like it might have been the last night in the office before the move out to San Francisco, and I don't remember who was telling the story, but you know he, I remember him comparing it to Lord of the Flies, because he was saying <laughs> that they just completely trashed the office. I think, yeah, that happened. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that we did. Like, you get on deadlines. Um, like, we had, like I said, a three and a three and a half week cycle to, like, get everything done. So the final week, especially, we were there, again, like, all day and all night. And um, so you'd always have deadline dinners. That was the big thing is, like, which, I again, I kind of love. It was kind of this weird thing where, like, you know, you always talk about how families you sit down at the table and eat together and everything like that's how we did deadline dinners, which I, I looking back on it, I just love that, that the fact that we did that, but shenanigans would, would, would definitely happen. Um, like especially once halo came out, cause we were crazy about halo. So there were some nights that even when we weren't on deadline that we would all hang out and hook the Xboxes up to the land and just play halo. Sure. And, um, I remember, one time we used to uh, four of us would sit in the boardroom on one team and then there was like this long hallway and then there were our cubicles were so four of us would sit in the cubicles and uh john dudlack <clears throat> was one of the editors and he was an amazing sniper and he loved to mess with crispin boyer because crispin would lose his temper really easily on 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 games so we had all had stayed and had dinner and it was like Chinese food or something and there was a little garbage can in the hallway because we would eat in the boardroom so that's where all the scraps were and John I think he headshotted Crispin like four or five times in a row and all of a sudden you just heard this blood curdling scream from down the hall and I remember looking up because there's a the doors had glass they were mostly glass doors and I saw Crispin charging at the door like he was pissed charging at the doors and he stopped and he kicked the garbage can which was full of soy sauce oh no so it just sprayed the whole wall <laughs> full of soy sauce so that was fun um and then the other th one of the other things i remember us doing is uh we ended up getting a motorized um skateboard we had a motorized skateboard so when we were there at night and we were getting a little bit crazy like and just sort of going stir crazy one of the things we used to love to do was when well, you'd ride the thing all over the place and we used to put Crispin, we used to lay Crispin down on it and put a helmet on his head and then stack up boxes and cans and something, just drive him into these. I don't know why, but one of the things down further in the office, there was like this little island where all the printers and stuff were kept because we were still printing a lot of proofs and everything. And somebody nailed that thing full on with this, this skateboard and ripped part of the wall completely off. And like, Again, we were a bunch of children, right? And on the other side of the building was the business side, like all the salespeople and the, uh, the, the all the stuff you need to run a magazine. And they looked down on us a lot, cause, and they should have, because we were, we were very immature. So we're sitting there. It's like, you know, 10 o'clock at night looking at this thing like, man, we're going to catch hell if uh, they come in and see this in the morning. So we ended up doing a hardware store run and buying like something to patch it up with and the closest red paint we could get. And we spent the rest of that night patching up this little section in the wall because we didn't want to get in trouble. And I, that's one of the things I remember from the day that we moved. We kind of all congratulated each other that nobody had ever noticed oh, that wow. we had destroyed that <laughs> section yeah. of the wall. And yeah. But um, my big memory about that day too is that we all knew something was in the air because we had just been bought. And uh, Ethan Einhorn was an editor at game now uh which is what expert gamer became and he had gotten it into his head <clears throat> that we were all being fired uh at least everybody on his magazine because they were sort of the the little brother you know they were um 
they were aiming at a much younger audience than EGM was, and plus EGM was the flagship. So he had come in the night before and cleaned out his desk because he was sure he was being fired. So when we we were all sitting there, and it just has so happened that the announcement was made right outside his cubicle. So we all walk in, and we're sitting in these chairs, and the first thing you see is this cubicle that yesterday had posters in it and a TV and a computer. It's dead empty. Like somebody, you know, it cleaned it right out. And it's like, what? So then we were all freaking out. I was like, what the hell's going on? Like, what? what's going to happen? But uh, no, it was when they announced that we were moving. Was he still um, there? Did he come to work that day? He did, yeah. And he, okay. he was one of the people who moved out west. So, um, but one of the things about Oak Brook that I loved, but it was also sort of the negative thing, is that most of the game industry... When EGM opened, when Ziff Davis, well, not when Ziff Davis, but when Sendai, when EGM opened, there was a lot of the video game industry concentrated in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Uh, like Konami was there, uh, Turbo Technologies, I think, was there, NEC anyway. Um, Midway, obviously, was there, and Williams and all that. <clears throat> but then a lot of them migrated west out to California. So by the time I was there, very little was left in the Chicago area, right? And so there was us and then Game Informer up in, I think they were in, were they in Milwaukee or I forget where they are anyway. Um, but they were in the Midwest as well. So like any time there was any event happening out in California, we would have to fly out. Or any time there was like a press tour happening for a game, they would always like have to make a special trip to us and to Game Informer. Um, which was great because we were both big enough that it was worth it. But, you know, so very rightfully so. You know, a lot of the higher ups and especially like, you know, editors in chief and stuff like that said, we're missing out a lot by being in the Midwest when everything's on the West Coast. Um, you know, like just just networking and stuff like that. Like, you know, we can't when we moved to San Francisco, you could leave work and then go down to a bar because we worked in downtown San Francisco. Like, go down to a bar and that's where all the Sega people hung out or, you know, so you just go sort of schmooze with those people. Um, and that was true. We that was negative, but it also was nice because we were so isolated from the rest of the industry. That was always my feeling as when we moved. I mean, I loved San Francisco when we were out there and, and it was, there were a lot of positives, but I kind of missed the whole, like being removed from it and just sort of being able to concentrate and do your thing. And it, that's something I feel like we really lost when we moved out West. Yeah. That, that's interesting. Uh, point of view uh yeah. before we move on since you brought up crispin boyer uh do you happen to remember there being a traffic cone in the office i do that uh, i forgot what they called it it was called cone the cone of violence yes the cone of violence yeah my understanding was that that was for him yes to, as a, yeah. to have a physical object to take his aggression out on because yes. apparently he'd been as you alluded to, he'd been sort of breaking equipment, you know, breaking. Crispin had fist prints and we used to have, we had metal uh, cabinets above our cubicles. And um, he had a fist print in that metal cabinet. Wow. And like, I remember I watched him slam a keyboard down once and watch the keys pop off the keyboard. And I feel, I feel bad when I bring stuff like that up because Crispin is like one of my favorite people. He's a super nice guy. He just, you know, I mean, he knew that he had this aggression, I think, and he just took it out on inanimate, inanimate objects. But yes, the cone of violence was a thing. Yeah. yeah, we had that around for him. I mean, that's people can be that way. Like, I think I'm a pretty even keeled, nice guy. But, you know, I've told the story on my show before that, you know, I used to when I was a kid, I would get so mad playing NES games that I would just oh. hold my controller cord and like whip the controller <laughs> around like a like a lasso or something. And we had like this, uh, our fireplace was like made out of stone, you know, like rough stone. And Mm. I would like whip it. Like I was trying to break my controller. Holy crap. Which, you know, testament to the build quality of Nintendo products. (laughs) It got, you know, it got some little divots in it, but I never did break it. I mean, maybe I was holding back a little bit. I don't really know. But um, so I can relate, you know, when you tell me that, you know, the things he was doing, you know, maybe I needed to have a cone of violence back then i think we all did yeah so how long uh did you stay with them after the move out to san francisco i was only there for like i think eight months um and that was because my work visa ran out like there was when i left 
the, my bio, my the bio in the final issue that I was in as a staffer, there was a joke about you know the uh, I, I don't know um, ICE or something like you know zip lining through the windows of of uh, Ziff Davis Towers to to escort me home. Yeah, and I think they had someone escorting me out the door or something like that. It's the the photo, but it wasn't that didn't happen. But it was there was a grain of truth there in that I wasn't allowed to stay. I had I had yeah. to leave. I wasn't deported, right? But I I couldn't work in the United States anymore. So, yeah. yeah so it was only like six to eight months, I think. Yeah. Do you remember? Well, I'm sure you remember what issue that was. I want to say it was the Vice City issue, maybe. Yeah. If not, it was very soon after that. I could probably I could walk over there and figure it out. I've got all my issues right, sitting back there, but not a big deal. But yeah, it was um, it was right after Vice City. I did a ton of work on on Vice City stuff. I remember, yeah. um, and then yeah, I had to go home. Yeah. All right. So you go you go home to Nova Scotia then. There. Yeah. And then then moved back you? in with my dad. That was a really oh you know that was that was really good for the ego. Yeah, I can imagine. So, but uh, so what did you end up doing next? Um, I did. Um, I did freelance for a long time. Like it actually I think worked out pretty well because I was able to spread out to non Ziff Davis. I was mostly Ziff Davis. I was still sort of on the front page as a contributor in EGM, doing a lot of work for OPM as well. I think I did stuff for the Xbox magazine too. But then I was able to like branch out and do stuff for um I want to say like PSM. I was writing a lot of scripts for game trailers reviews for quite a while. Oh, all right. Uh, which I really miss. I loved game trailers. Um, and I was writing uh, reviews for X-Play for a long time as well. Um, and Games Radar, doing a lot. For Games Radar, I think it was UK though. Um, but anyway, just sort of getting, you know, getting a chance to, to, um, to contribute everywhere. And that worked out really great. For the longest time, especially because, of course, being in Nova Scotia and being paid in your powerful American dollars, like every dollar I made was like a buck forty here. Yeah. So you know, I couldn't complain about that. Um, but then I, it was like a blessing and a curse when I left because it wasn't didn't feel like that long after that that all the layoffs started to happen and yeah. everyone was tightening their belts, and so that kind of fell apart after a while because um, I. I <laughs> I was in a much bigger pool of freelancers, and there right. were a ton of them in on the West Coast, so it just made more sense to to give that work to people who had just lost their jobs, basically. So, um, so that was kind of what led into me doing game development, yeah, trying to get back into game development. I actually did get a job at Game Trailers at one point, um, so I was all set to move to Santa Monica, um, which was God. Uh, <laughs> 18 years ago i had just just gotten married um we'd gone on our honeymoon and the plan was to come back from the honeymoon pack up our lives and drive from nova scotia to santa monica which uh it would have been a long drive but um we got to the border and they'd screwed up the paperwork on my uh visa so they wouldn't let us in we actually got turned away at the border um the the border guard was he was super nice about it he was like because the the main thing was again i as i mentioned before i didn't have a college degree which is kind of what you needed for an h1b visa right and um the guy was like you know he even looked at me at one point he's like do you have anything like a typing certificate or something like did you take a typing course anything like that i can put on this to say you've got like a post-secondary education and i was like no i don't he's like i can't let you i can't let you in wow so um yeah i came we, we turned around and drove back home and uh, yeah, but again, game trailers closed a couple of years later. Yeah, so I think it was probably for the best. Right. So, how yeah. are you able to transition from doing journalism to get into the development world? <clears throat> so, I um, one of the last, not the last, but one of the games that I covered when I was at EGM because I was previews editor at EGM. Uh, so you know that big chunk of the magazine, it was my job to organize that every month. Um, so the first week of my month, well, I was always doing it, but the mainly the first week of the month, I was on the phone constantly with all the different PR reps for the different companies. I had like this, which I God, I wish I still had a copy of. I had this spreadsheet that was just like a schedule that was like X number of months out, um, of like even code names for things that were in developments, like, you know, check back on this then. And then it was my job to sort of 
get an idea of like what needs two pages, what needs to go in the front, et cetera, et cetera. And approved by my boss, Dan Shu, obviously. And um, at one point, um, I ended up getting an opportunity to go to North Carolina to a company called Vicious Cycle um, to cover Robotech Battlecry. And I'm a huge Robotech fan. Like I grew up, that was, I came home from school and I watched Robotech. Like that was my thing. And then I go and do my paper route. Like I was just, and I've always been a massive Robotech fan. And the PR person I was talking to knew that. I don't know why. I must have been a big enough nerd that I had said to them, like, I'm a huge Robotech fan. And so they had said, like, you know, we feel like if there's anybody that should cover this game, you should. You know, plus, again, we're EGM, so we want to get in the pages of EGM. We know you're excited about this. Let's go out. So I went out and I met the team. And I had like, you know, dinner with the president of the company and all that sort of thing because you're getting wine to dine because they want they want coverage. <clears throat> so I did that. I forget what issue it was, but it was like a big two page spread on this this Robotech Battlecry game. And I kept in, tr- in touch with Eric Peterson was the, was the president of the company. I kept in touch with him all through the game coming out, uh, the reviews, sort of just chatting with him casually. And he. uh so I told him what had happened with me and with game trailers. And I was kind of distraught about it. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know, because I don't think there's very many opportunities for me at this point. And I'm so far away. And, you know, it's just I, I might have to get out of games. And he just out of the blue said, well, have you ever thought of making them? And I was like, I, I thought of it, but I, you know, I don't really I didn't know how my skill set would translate. And he was like, well, we're hiring level designers. Like, why don't you come on down and check out the next Robotech game. We're hiring them for the next Robotech game. Why don't you come on down and check that out? And so I did, and I went down and I interviewed, and um, I got hired as a level designer for Robotech Invasion for the sequel to Battlecry. Um, but it was all because of it was all because of that coverage and, and about staying in touch. Again, it was all networking, right? Staying in touch yeah. with Eric. So he hired me, like, pretty quickly. And they their lawyer figured out how to get me into the country <laughs> yeah. without, without, a, without a degree. So, yeah. And how'd that work out, uh, that first job? <clears throat> it was pretty great. Um, I, I mean, loved did you Raleigh. Have... I lived in Raleigh. D- Sorry, not to interrupt. Do you have yeah. any previous experience doing level design, like even just on your not own, like all. making Doom wads no. or anything? No. No, okay. not at all. Okay. No. And it was like, so level design, it was, it was, uh, it's kind of a misnomer. Like we weren't designing levels. The levels were designed. Like <clears throat> the, 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 the architecture of the level had been designed sort of based on the specs given by the game designer because he had a very specific story in mind. So what we were given as level designers, we were actually encounter designers more than anything else. Like it's, you know, here are the we'd be given this this piece of, of land or buildings or whatever, and like here's the critical path, here are the story beats. Whatever happens between A and B and B and C is up to you. Like you're designing this so that something's happening. You're designing the encounters. So that's what we were doing. Um, I'd never done it before. It was fascinating because it was all scripting. I'd never done any of that stuff before. But like we were in like their uh, custom engine, laying down uh, mesh so that the characters could walk around, telling the enemies what to do, when they should spawn, how they should spawn. Um, it was great. I loved it. I mean, I loved the work. Um, but it was we were also on crunch because we were in the final year of development. Uh, development times weren't as long back then, but... You know, we were in the final year of development. So, I mean, we were working like 12 hour days, like six or seven days a week for a good chunk of the time I was there. So I was really happy to get it shipped. The game did not review well. <laughs> um, and then I ended up working on a second game, just help finishing up a second game called Spy vs. Spy for the Xbox. And uh, then I was like, my, my visa was up and we had to have the discussion like, you know, we want you to stay, but it needed to be renewed every year. And I just said, like, I'm done. I can't do this. Like, I was with my, uh, my, uh, what, you know, now that I'm saying this, I'm actually realizing it's backwards. The game trailers thing came after this. I was with my wife to be at the time. She was living with me and we knew we wanted to get married and start a family. And I had said to Eric, like, I can't, I can't start a family and be working, you know, 12 hours a day. Right. I, I just can't. Plus, gonna do i'm gonna do the whole canadian thing it's real expensive to have a baby in in the united states yeah and i I wasn't making that kind of money so right you know it was better to go home so we did we went back home yeah and tried to go to game trailers and that didn't work and yeah so we stayed in nova scotia yeah 
Yeah. And you remember what was the what was the next step then? The next step is I wanted to get out of games. Oh. I was kind of done, kind of done with it. Um that was I I did finally go back to school. I went to like a career college uh for media because we've been doing the podcast for a while. Uh Chris Johnson and I had started Player One and um I really enjoyed it. Like I was like, I think I could do this. I wanted to go for radio. I don't know what it is with me and picking the industries that are ready to go into the toilet, but I wanted to go into radio. <clears throat> so I went to this career college locally, uh, but the whole course was doing radio and television. And so I uh, did that, did the radio and television thing, and ended up falling in love with television, uh, video editing. Not that I'm any good at it, but like learning to video edit. And especially, um, I found I was pretty de- a pretty decent cameraman. So it was for news coverage and stuff like that. And it was just super exciting, like going out because part of part of our work was to uh, go out and actually produce a news show, like a weekly news show. So, like, I remember going with a television camera to like protests where like fights broke out between like protesters and police, and like it was just getting great footage, and I was really enjoying it. So, so I ended up, yeah, getting out of video games altogether and doing television for a while. It was just sort of like a local community channel, but um, again, no money in that. Um, we just had our first baby and I was making like 20 grand a year and my wife couldn't find work. So that's when I ended up getting a hold of HP studios in Nova Scotia and uh, other ocean, which was up in Prince Edward Island and, um, saying like, I, I need, I need work again <laughs> in the games industry and going back into the game industry. I ended up going to HP studios as a game designer. Yeah. After that. Yeah. And yeah. What have you, uh, what have you done there? Um, we did a few like we wear titles, uh, mm-hmm. like uh, solitaire game and stuff like that. But the big thing that they had made their name on, they're they're two K now. They're a two K studio now. They do um, two K golf. Oh, whatever that's called. Yeah. <clears throat> now they didn't. They weren't doing that then. But they were doing a lot of contract work for Electronic Arts. Yeah. Um, Sorry, so now I'm trying to think. I can't remember what that golf game is called. I forget what it's called too. It, they did a game themselves called Golf Club. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know that and golf club. Yeah. That was what led to my understanding. I don't know, but yeah. that was what led to 2K saying, like, you should do our golf game. And they ended up being a 2K studio. Um, but no, we were doing a lot of EA stuff. So probably the biggest things that I worked on while I was there from the EA side was I ended up working on Madden 12 and 13. Yeah. Uh, first one for the Wii and the second one for the PS3 and the Xbox, whatever Xbox was out at the time. Yeah. Doing, 360, I guess. Doing what? Uh, so for Madden Wii, I was the game designer, the con- the the, cl- um, the contractor game designer. So there was an actual game designer uh, from Tiburon, um, another place where I actually got hired and I couldn't go because of because of uh, work visa stuff. I got hired to do NASCAR games, oh. which would have been like the perfect thing for me. But again, yeah. they couldn't work out the work visa. Um, but yeah, like I was the in studio designer for that. The th- the thing that I loved about that is that. The Wii code was resurrected, uh, you know, like it's Madden. So Madden, of course, they don't rewrite the game every year. It's last year's code with new features and any bugs that existed before. And I remember our um, our developers digging into the code the first time and finding references to the Genesis in some wow. of the codes, some of the code, which yeah. I thought was amazing. But um, yeah, so just sort of in-studio designer for like the, I, I, I don't know if there was a story mode or something like that, but it was such a tangled mess of code where like developers would joke about how you wanted to change something in like a menu screen, but now suddenly you have five downs for a first instead of four. Like, uh-huh. like it was just, everything was so interconnected and, and it was so tangled that it was hard to, uh, it was hard to figure out. I do remember there was this great moment where the designer whose name I forget that we were working on working with at, at Tiburon sent us a video of, um, I don't know if you ever watched Canadian football. Very little. But it's, it's different. Yeah. Like it's a lot different. Um, and there was a play that had happened the, the previous night where like, I think they, they, they kicked for a field goal. And when you miss, if it stays in, in Canadian football, I think if you, if the opposing team catches it, they can kick it back out. Oh, all right. Like the play is still going. Yeah. So like there, I think it was a field, it was a field goal or a punt, but either way it was kicked into the end zone, didn't hit the uprights, which are at the front of the end zone in CFL. 
Somebody kicked it back out, and it was picked up by the opposing team again. They kicked it back into the end zone. Like, it was just this ridiculous play, and I can't explain why. All It, it was just an email he sent with the subject line, like, what are you doing to our game? Yeah. Like, what is wrong with you people up there? This is <laughs> yeah. This is not football. Um, but anyway, so, and then Madden 13 was um, the um, – uh, a career mode or create a career mode or something like that. It was all front end. It was I was the producer on the front end for Madden 13. And then the other big thing that we did that I was super proud of there is a game called Baller Beats. So it's an NBA game that was made for the, uh, um, what the heck is that thing called? The Connect. It was made for the Connect. It's a music game, but you play by dribbling. Oh, all right. The basketball. Yeah. Um, it's ridiculous, but it's got sort of a following uh, yeah. because it's so weird. But yeah, that was, uh, we created a music game where you played by dribbling the basketball. And, like the whole idea was like, okay, now you have to dribble it between your legs. You have to go around behind you, like stuff like that. And we're pretty proud of it because it was, it tracked all that just using the Connect camera yeah. oh. and nothing else. Wow. It I just see. used like a regular NBA ball. So, wow. Yeah. So somebody could actually, they would actually have a basketball. Yeah, it was sold with a basketball. Oh, okay, I see. I was imagining was like, them using like the little hand remote things or something instead no, no, of a basketball. No, that is pretty cool. We were too cool. Yeah, it was different. Yeah. Since yeah, you brought it up, uh, what's your what's your position on golf video games? I think they're really relaxing. Yeah, I suck at them. Yeah, but they're really relaxing. Um, I was I always was kind of into them. I love the. Um, the NES Open. Oh, yes. Game. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. I was a huge Mario Golf fan. Um, I did a Mario Golf Game Boy Color strategy for Pocket Games one time, and oh. it was some of the most fun I've ever had. Yeah. Like, Game Boy Color Mario Golf is is way up there. That's a very well-regarded game. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. No, I love a good golf game. Yeah. Uh, it's too bad about the latest Mario Golf. Yeah. I don't like that at all. Yes. But. I agree. Um, so sorry, does that, that doesn't catch us up to the present yet, does it? With uh... No, um, I ended up working at Frontier Studios for a while because they bought the Halifax office of HP Studios. So like we worked on uh, Coaster Crazy, um, Elite Dangerous. Our studio did a little bit of work on Elite Dangerous. And then they ended up closing the Halifax studio and ended up uh, going to my current job, which was video game related, uh, but I don't do games anymore. Um, oh, right. We had a gaming studio or a gaming team that I ran for a while, but uh, we were never seriously. It was all like uh, um, flash games and stuff for kids, that sort of thing. I see. No. So, all right. Uh, so, Nova Scotia. Let's get back to Nova Scotia here for a second. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, the closest Canadian NHL team would be uh, the Habs, Montreal. right? Yeah. 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 Is that. I, I, I'm going to get to your whole situation in a second, but is for, you know, people in your, in your area, I guess, or maybe in, in Nova Scotia as a whole who are NHL fans, is that primarily who they're fans of, you would say, or here, I would say like 90% of NHL fans are Habs, Leafs or Bruins. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Right. We have Halifax has a relationship with Boston. Um, oh, I don't I part of it is I think I don't know if this is true so have you ever heard of the Halifax explosion no so the Halifax explosion you should look it up it was a World War one incident so Halifax is a, is a harbor I mean we're a harbor town yeah um so back in the during the wars when convoys were going across the Atlantic they would they would uh start from Halifax Harbor or New York but you know, I think mostly Halifax Harbor. So like we were a World War One town, World War Two town. My my uh, grandfather was in the Navy and he used to do like Coast Guard and stuff like that uh, during World War Two. But um, so we always had a lot of munition ships and stuff like that. And in 1917, there was an accident in the harbor that included a ship that was just loaded to the gills with ammunition and explosives and stuff like that. And it ended up catching fire and exploding wow. and leveling Halifax. It was the biggest oh. man-made explosion before 
Hiroshima. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. So the reason I'm putting that out there is because yeah. <clears throat> obviously the city was flattened. It was in winter, which is cold here. Um, there was like a terrible snowstorm the next day. And Boston sent a bunch of relief and a bunch of people and workers to us. Oh. To, to the point that like we, if you go down to Boston at Christmas, uh, I don't know where it is exactly, but there's like a big Christmas tree they put up every year. That mm -hmm. comes from Nova Scotia. We send them a Christmas tree every year. Oh, wow. And it's just like we have this relationship with Boston. Yeah. So, but anyway, I think that's where a lot of that comes from. My whole family's Bruins fans. They, okay. I grew up in a family of Bruins fans. Yeah. So. I can't stand Habs fans. <laughs> why is that? They're the worst. So they're like the Canadian version of like New England Patriots fans. Absolutely. Okay. That's exactly what they are. I didn't know that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there, is there, sorry, is there a football team that people are super passionate about that has never won a thing or hasn't won anything for like 50 years or however long the NFL has been around? Uh, well, not Lions? that long, but well, yeah, the Lions have never won anything, but I mean, they don't have a huge fan base, but you know, okay. uh, I mean, I was going to compare it more to like the Dallas Cowboys just because yeah. like there's Dallas Cowboys fans all throughout the country. They're all uh, very obnoxious, but they haven't won anything in a very long time. You know, twenty. Those are Toronto Maple Leafs fans. Okay, then yeah, that's that's what they haven't won anything since nineteen sixty seven. So. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, cards on the table. I'm a forty uh, San Francisco Forty ers fan. They also haven't won a Super Bowl in a very long time. But I don't think we have. You know, it's like uh, Dallas Cowboys are referred to as America's team. And, oh uh, please, yeah. See, the Maple Leafs are referred to as Canada's team. Oh yeah, well there you go. Yeah, and they won any. But but you're a 49ers fan. But you were you're the right age to have been a Montana kid, right? Oh, 100. Like, is that why? Yeah. Well, no, yeah, that's okay. just that's my local team. Okay. Well, that see, I don't get to say that. So okay, yeah, yeah. that's fair. Um, but I mean, they have Montana. Oh yeah, it's like I yes, it, it made it that much easier. Like oh, they're the, yeah. that, they're the best team of the decade, and they're also my local team. Great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, side note about the Cowboys, they, they're not in the same stadium anymore, but in their old stadium, there was this uh, little bit of the roof that was retractable. Like, I know now it's not a big deal. You can have these stadiums with these huge right. retractable. This is before that technology was available. So for them to have that at all was like, wow. And the saying was, is that they could open the stadium up so that God could watch his team play. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, uh, that makes me feel sick. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, all that being said, how uh -huh. did you end up being a Pittsburgh Penguins fan? <laughs> uh, I like Mario Lemieux. All right. That's that, a was, very, that was it. That's a very I mean, good reason. Yeah. Like, when I was growing up, obviously, we had Edmonton. We had Wayne Gretzky, like the, the great one. Like, yeah. there was nobody better. And when Lemieux – I wasn't a big hockey fan. Like, I'm – it's funny, like I mentioned to you about tomorrow where, like, my son has two football games and a lacrosse practice and everything. Like, he's – super into sports i wasn't like that at all i played some baseball when i was really young my brother was the big hockey fan my dad was a big hockey fan so you kind of even if you weren't super into it though you kind of had a team that you would pull for and i just liked lemieux um it didn't hurt that sega had a mary lemieux hockey game that that probably might have helped help me along a little bit but he was like the next he was supposed to be the next one right like they called yeah. him the magnificent one he was supposed to be sort of the the heir apparent to wayne gretzky yeah um and i just liked him a lot so that was really it and then they won the cup in like 93 and 94 or something like that and so i was i was hooked because i got to rub it in the faces of all my bruins friends and all my canadians friends and yeah yeah wasn't it 91 92 and then 92 93 they went That's back to back was. cups right with, yeah, that's with, what it is, 90, 92, 93. Yeah. With Scotty Bowman as our head coach. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and then, so that, so sorry, to further to that, sure. and then, Sydney, you know, I, I'm very much like a, um, I'm not a bandwagon jumper at all. Yeah. So, like, that's my team. For better or worse. Yeah. Pittsburgh's, and there were, there was a lot of worse. Sure. After the mid-90s. Like, they, they were really in the toilet. And then Sidney Crosby came along. Yeah, we don't say the S word on this show. Uh -huh. But yeah. he's from here. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Right? So that didn't hurt either. Is that uh, is that uh, clothes dryer that he used to shoot into as a kid? Is that on display somewhere there? Is it that is. like in the town it's square? In, it's in our uh, our sports museum and where, where that team plays that I was talking about. Oh, that's awesome. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I forgot what I was going to say, but yeah, uh, you know, I'm a I'm a Detroit Red Wings fan, so we're going through the horrible right now. Oh God, so. yeah, we're about to. I think I think they finally have to start rebuilding Pittsburgh. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, this has been going on for kind of a while, so I don't want to keep you too much longer. But I did have one more thing that I okay. just wanted, mostly to give you the opportunity to talk about, uh, and that is the work that you do uh, with or for uh, Extra Life. Yeah. Um, so I, what am I in like 13 or 14 years now? Yeah. 13, I think. Uh, and please, raising money. F- please do explain to the folks at home uh, who don't right. know so what it's Extra a, Life it's a charity. is. It's a video game. Well, it's it's a gaming based charity. I don't want to say video game because they've really branched out to like board games and stuff like that. But it was something that was introduced to me by a guy named TJ Lowerman, who uh, he used to run a, a thing called That Sports Gamer. I don't know if he still does. But he was a fan of Player One of our show, and he reached out because he was doing this extra life thing, and he wanted to find out if people were interested and uh, if I'd um, want to be on his team. So I did it that year and uh, raised like seven hundred and seventy dollars. But the whole thing is, is yeah, like you, you basically you um, you sign up and you uh, commit to playing video games for a twenty four hour stretch. It's a gaming marathon on a very specific date every year, sometime in November usually, and it's a children's miracle network charity where you um get to choose to support a hospital in that network so usually your local children's hospital which here we have the iwk health center uh which covers nova scotia pei and new brunswick i believe because we're not very big provinces um and i jumped at the chance because i mean it was a chance to play video games for good cause which i was happy about but i have a bit of a um a soft spot for the IWK, um, I had a, I had a, I mean, I have a brother. I used to have two brothers. I had a brother who uh, died of leukemia in 1983, and so, and he spent most of his life at the IWK. So we spent a lot of time there. So where there was that, but also over the ensuing years, like I have three kids now, and so we spent a lot of time there at the IWK, and we rely on them. And all my kids were born in the Grace Maternity side of the IWK. So it was like, if I have a chance to do this. And raise money for that hospital that's so important to me and so important to the region. And all I have to do is sit on my ass and play video games. You know, why wouldn't I do that? So, yeah, I've been raising money now for, uh, I think, 13 years. This year, I think we're going to hit a really big milestone, which is uh, we're going to hit a grand total of $100,000 raised. Wow. All told over the over that span. Um, if If the fundraising keeps up the way it normally should sometime this November we should hit that milestone. So I'm super excited about that. But yeah, um and I just I do fundraising all year for it. Um I stream on Twitch, Twitch TV slash sewer three nights a week, Monday, Tuesday and Thursday. And all of that is to raise money for extra life. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 It's super important to me. I mean, uh like I said, as a father, the the, the original reason I started was for my brother, but uh as a father, you know, you it's you you want to have a place like that around. Yeah. Uh, do you, so you stream three times a week. So you, you stream the same game, like over the course of multiple nights um, ever. Like, do you, you say, oh, we're going to try to play through, uh, you know, a meteor game or. No, I usually switch them out. Like, I, on Monday nights, I've been, we, something that was coined Adventure Night. And it started basically because I decided to play, I think, King's Quest One or something like that. Yeah. And my, uh, my, my viewership, which is small but mighty, um, they, uh, they they thought it was hilarious because of course they'd had the parser input so we could put in whatever we wanted and it was just ended up being a, a good time. So then we decided to kind of do like the chronological adventure game thing. Oh, cool! On Mondays, on Tuesdays I used to just grab something out of my collection, but then somebody along the line said like we'd love to see all the Shining games, Sega Shining games, which is like well I'll take an opportunity to play those. So Tuesdays I've been playing through those. I'm on I'm halfway through Shining Force right now. And then Thursdays, I sort of gave order my donors. So anybody who makes a fifty dollar donation or more gets to pick anything they want me to play that night, within reason, because um, I have a pretty decently large game collection, thanks to getting a lot of stuff for free over the years. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's sort of what I've been doing. So it's kind of a free for all on Thursdays, but Mondays and Tuesdays. And right now, I'm actually been playing through Snatcher on Monday nights yeah. as well. So. But so, so you'll yeah, so you'll do is. that like every Monday night. We're going to keep playing Snatcher until yeah. it's done. Until we finish. Yeah, yep. that's pretty awesome. 
Yeah. So, and, and it's, you know, the thing that I love about it too, like all that money's been raised and it's kind of along the same lines as, as player one, um, is that we don't have like the biggest audience, but we have a supremely dedicated audience. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's, that's all you need, right? I'd love to, yeah. I'd love for us to be reaching like a million people. Sure. But you know, if you've got the people who are super into it and are part of a great part of your community, like I, I go on your discord and I know you've got sort of the same thing going on Yeah, where you've just got like sort of your regulars who are there and they're kind of dedicated to being part of the community. And that's, yeah, that's all you need. That's what I say. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, cause you know, I got to make the videos for CGQ plus. It's not, like they get a ton of, ton of views, but it's just like, it's always the same people watching and commenting. Yeah. And that's what I think is cool. You know, you, see the same names and whatnot and yeah and that's one of the things that <clears throat> i am i wanted to say too and like because one of the things that i've really grown to appreciate especially i mean i've been a fan of your stuff and of Corey's stuff for years now but one of the things that i've really grown to appreciate in the last year or two is that <clears throat> you guys haven't given over to like the supreme negativity oh yeah uh to drive hits yeah. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. Or or drama or beef or whatever. Right. I, I hate all that um, stuff. Me too. Like I'm just I'm I'm so over it. So like yeah. I see you doing like the CGQ plus stuff and see the numbers and it's like, yeah, he's not he's not doing this for like tens of thousands or, or you know, hundreds of thousands of views. Yeah. But that's like the same reason that I do my show is like yeah. it's just as much for me as it is for anybody else. It'd be great to have the big numbers, but I don't really yeah. care. Yeah. <laughs> that much that comes with its own problems so yeah i'm not exactly. uh i'm happy with things as they are so yeah uh anyway that's an hour and a half so that's usually where we wrap it up and i know that it's i don't even know what day of the week it is way over there <laughs> it's, it's so far it's sunday oh okay wow yeah. well, there you go um thank you so much for for coming on the show uh episode 29 this was episode 29 of here's my question for you the great depression episode there you go. 1929. Wait a yeah. sec. No. What? That's no good. I don't want All the right. episode I'm on to be called the Great Depression All episode. Right. Sorry, I just, I've been struggling to come up every week with like what, <laughs> you know, it's the best right. I got. Okay. Uh, again, next week we'll have Corey back. Corey is fine. Mother Carlson, if you've watched this far, listened this far either way through the episode, he's okay. He'll be back next week. And uh, yeah. So thanks to Greg Seward for coming on the show. And I hope everybody has a good week.